welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Welcome to Syosset Library's Turn the Page podcast. This is Jessica, and we have a amazing guest today who has narrated several audiobooks and also has done some uh, Pokemon voiceovers. I have to throw that in there because so many of us are big geeks here at Syosset Library and our listeners as well. Uh, so please introduce yourself and um, tell us a little bit about how you got into the narrating business. All right. Well, hi, I'm Michael Crouch. I'm an audiobook narrator and voice actor. And my background is in theater. Uh, I did shows all through middle school and high school. And I went to college. Uh, I went to Ithaca College for musical theater. And I did a little bit of theater after college, but I soon kind of felt that my heart wasn't in it. I didn't know. I, I didn't really think I wanted to build a life around that. So I started to look into voiceover, see what that was about. Um, so I read a book about the business and I took a class um, to learn the basics of it. And I fell in love with it. And it's really just, it's still acting, but in front of a microphone. Uh, so it wasn't that crazy of a transition from theater to voiceover. And long, long story short, I eventually worked my way into um, actually getting jobs in that field. Uh, the occasional commercial, a little bit of animation, anime, industrial voiceover, and... Then I was like curious about audiobooks, and a colleague of mine had taken a class taught by this producer director coach named Paul Rubin and she just raved about him and I'm like oh okay well I've never done audiobooks I'll take this class and I found it fascinating and um, it just so happened that this was the best timing of anything that's ever happened in my career it was it was a, a class where we met once a week for six weeks. So like between weeks three and four, I happened to get an audiobook audition for a book for Random House, Random House Audio, uh, that I could record from home. I'm like, okay, okay. And I very consciously applied what I'd been learning in the class to this audition. And then right after the class ended, I found out I got it. It was amazing. That was the, that's the origin story. That's a great origin story. And looking at the catalog of books that you've narrated for Random House, I mean, you you like run the gamut. I mean, of course, you were the narrator for Simon versus the Homo Sapiens Agenda. Mm -hmm. That's one of my favorites. Yeah, that book is just like one of those books that's so important to so many people. Um, so I don't blame you for that being a favorite. Um, but then you have like bathhouse, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> which is like, I mean, it's great. I love bathhouse. I have to put that out there. I love it. <laughs> Everybody who hears my episodes on the podcast knows that the weirder, the better. And I love uh -huh. horror. Um, uh -huh. But man, talk about showing some range. A and then you have like children's books uh, for instance, A New Day by Brad Meltzer. How do you how do you decide? I mean, is it decided for you? Do you audition for each part? Or do you just look and you're just like, I feel like today I'm just going to throw everyone for a loop and narrate this crazy horror book? Uh, well, I wish I had that kind of freedom, uh, but I don't. Usually I, 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 I get offers and... 99% of the time I take the job. Uh, so I just, I take what I'm given. The only times maybe I would turn something down is usually less to do with content and more to do with budget. Um, but yeah, uh, 
getting the work, it, it really varies. Sometimes I have to audition for it. Other times the producer has sent a sample of previous work I've done to the author uh, without my knowing about it usually. And uh, the author has said, oh yeah, I want him. And so then I just get an email from the producer with an offer, which is fantastic. That's how it yeah. happens most of the time. I mean, that sounds pretty great. And I think you, you've won some awards also for your voice acting. Am I correct? Uh, yeah, some, yeah. Like the Golden Voice Award, I believe. Yeah, that was a really cool honor from Audiophile Magazine. Um, just kind of, it's, it's basically their Lifetime Achievement Award and to be in the company of such legends in this business is is it's a wonderful honor so let's talk a little bit about how it works do you mainly work from home and do you get a lot of direction uh from the people who are i guess producing the audiobooks yeah that there's it also really depends there's there's a range of scenarios so let's talk pre-pandemic I did about 75% of my recording in studios outside of my home studio. I, d I do have a home studio, but um, I would do most of my audio audiobook work like in-house at Penguin Random House. They've got four studios in their offices in New York and or other studios in Midtown or Flatiron. Um, that's my preference because it just it just feels good to get out and interact with people when doing these things. Um, and so about 25% I would do from home. And that can range from me being totally 100% solo through the recording process, me being my own engineer, self-directing and, and recording the whole thing and sending the raw audio to an editor to fine tune and, and then a separate, usually quality control engineer to make sure there are no, or no, there, there won't be zero mistakes. They're gonna catch my mistakes and uh, alert me so that I can fix them. Um, or I could be from home and have a director and maybe even an engineer too zoomed or Skyped in. And so I will be interacting with them, just not in person. I think the pandemic has changed things for so many people and just how they work voiceovers in general. Um, I, I know some other people in voiceover who work from home and either like they have like a studio in their closet or they have something called a whisper room. Um, mm -hmm. But I, it's, it's refreshing to hear somebody say they actually prefer to be out in the field. Absolutely. I, I don't know if it's what I call COVID brain. Um, and there's a term that I, I use, I guess, just with my friends called accelerated introversion, where all of us who maybe naturally were inclined to introversion, but have, you know, worked our ways through it to be in the work field, found that those early days of COVID just sort of pushed us back in that hole and we had a hard time getting out of it. But mm -hmm. what I'm hearing, and I think that it's very interesting, is that, and I guess this is your theater background, you know, you like the interaction uh yeah um i do i mean so even if it's just an audiobook where it's a solo narration I, i'm still to do it i'm interacting with p other people in the studio in the room the engineer or the director and it, it gets me out of my head and i find that helpful i'm i'm not one of those actors who craves doing like scene work with other people in the booth. I, I enjoy that, but I mean, that's not something I miss too much. What I, what I really do miss though, is when I'm doing my job in front of the mic, having other people in the room to hear what I'm doing, to give me feedback, to reinforce the good things that are going on, instead of all of that bouncing around in my head, having to play every role at home. <laughs> yeah, that's, something that I've always found fascinating about voice acting in general um how you know like and especially people who do multiple voices you you must feel like you're very much in your head a lot uh, it, it can be easy to go there uh but I think we all do our best work when we don't get trapped there 
I know I can definitely say that's the case with me. So when you are, um, do you, do you ever talk to other audiobook narrators? Um, you know, um, are you like, do you ever compare notes? Do you interact with them much? Yeah. Um, I have narrator friends and colleagues that we compare notes, sometimes get coffee here and there. I don't do a ton of that. I should actually do more of that. Um, but it, and at the very least, we may interact on social media, uh, sometimes DM each other. Um, it's a good community. It really seems like it. And audiobooks are just so big. Uh, I think, especially with people who are commuting a lot, um, and also just the fact that, you know, literacy comes in so many different forms. And having that audio is essential for so many. Um, but you, you, you've mentioned you've also done voiceover work in like television and animation and industrial. How does doing a book uh, differ from those other fields? Well, the biggest difference is that audiobooks require a lot of stamina. I mean, it just, you're recording page after page after page of material. Uh, it's a lot. Uh, but when you're able to get into a flow and get out of your head, like I was talking about, it's so fulfilling. Uh, that's, that's when I really love it. Um, when I can just dive into the text and explore. And that's when I don't want the pages to stop, where I can just, I, I can be in it and, and just be there. Uh, with, with the other stuff, the scripts are shorter and the, the sessions are shorter. And that can be nice. Um, but, you know, depending on the job, it's, it's from, in my experience, those jobs aren't as fulfilling because you, you do them real quick, you go in, you maybe have a little fun, maybe not, and, and you get paid and bye. I mean, I don't know. My, my heart isn't, my heart belongs to audiobooks. You don't really get to live with, with what you're doing or, you know, I guess yeah. in industrial or for commercials, like you're not really a character. You're lending your voice for the advertisement. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It, yeah. I, um, and even with animation, like the animation sessions I've done, it's always been, I think, I think every single one I've done, it's just been me in the booth, even though it's scene work back and forth. Uh, I'll just record my lines back to back to back to back. And maybe the director or engineer in the room will read the other person's lines. But I, 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 I'm never, I haven't been in a situation where I'm in the room interacting with uh, the person, my scene partner, which is, which can be strange. So I would prefer then if I'm going to be solo to be just doing all the characters so I can at least play off myself. Right. That's, that's a very interesting way of looking at it. I actually think you're the first person to say that, which is like one of my favorite things about this interview so far. There's a lot of perspective that is new and I haven't heard from others who we, I've interviewed in the field, which is amazing. Uh, so um, a few more questions. Well, first of all, according to your Twitter, you are a lover of fluffy cats. <laughs> do you yes. have any? Do you have any cats, and do they have literary names? <laughs> oh, um, well, I don't have any cats now, but I did have a beautiful fluffy cat, and I suppose she did have a literary name. Her name was Scarlett O'Hara Crouch. That's so an that's amazing name for a cat. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know why I named her that, but I, I did. That's really great. So a question I have about just like the process, because when I, I, I know that when we do turn the page and it's impossible to take them all out and it actually doesn't sound particularly natural because we're an interview podcast but we find ourselves saying um and you know a lot 
do you, does that get edited out postscript or are you able to just omit that from your language? Uh, it's so adding little vocal gestures like um and uh, uh well you know the, because when you're audiobook recording yeah like i mean are you you're reading from a script completely i mean the way the reason i ask is because in natural speech the way that i guess i speak and like some of our other interviewers we don't realize we're filling the space with a lot of ums and you knows yeah but yeah, i yeah. would imagine that's kind of a no-no when you're doing an audiobook narration definitely with audiobooks i i need to take care to read exactly what's on the page not add anything no ums no sometimes i will be totally present and i will say a line of text from the book that still the meaning is still very clear but maybe i've inverted a couple words maybe i've changed something so slightly and depending on the publisher if they want it word perfect they'll they'll have me go back and correct it later so that it's exactly what's on the page uh but you know for for a lot of commercials uh they encourage you to add little ums and ahs to keep it as natural and flowy for you as possible so those situations can be different that's actually very interesting. I hadn't thought of that in terms of commercials. And like I mentioned, when when I'm editing Turn the Page, and this is a little aside to anyone who listens to us, it also depends on just time and how time consuming it is. There are times when I will omit certain gestures like that because it's too much and because it holds up the conversation. But I had somebody a while back who uh, listened to the early version and said, I, I just want you to take all the ums out. And it just didn't sound like a natural conversation between oh, okay. people, if that makes sense. Absolutely. So uh, bringing it back to your field, that's fascinating. Yeah, well, and I have similar feelings about uh, when breaths get over edited. Um, I, I'm a fan of cleaning up breaths in audiobooks. I don't think you need every single breath on the track, but sometimes editors will go all out and remove every single one, and it just doesn't sound natural. It doesn't sound like a conversation like you're talking about with the ums and the ahs. Yeah, I, I and you want that breath because it proves that this is a living, breathing being. Absolutely. So sometimes, as you mentioned, sometimes it just doesn't fit or it's awkward or it's unnecessary, but sometimes it expresses a feeling without using words. So I, I appreciate that you as an actor don't find that lazy to leave some of them in. Oh, I, no, I am very much in favor of, of leaving expressive breaths on the track. So before we sign off, uh, is there anything upcoming that you can talk about that you're working on? Hmm, well. That was a pretty great expressive breath, which I was <laughs> leaving in. That had emotion. <laughs> Keep it. Yes. Um, well, let me see. What am I doing right now? Uh, I just did uh, the author Neil Schusterman uh, co-wrote a book with his son, Jared Schusterman, uh, and it's called Roxy. It's coming out in the next couple months. Fabulous. Uh, Neil Schusterman is so good. I think his scythe cycle, cycle of a scythe, is uh -huh. one of those series that blows my mind every day that I think about it, even though I already finished it forever ago. Yeah, uh, th I, I haven't listened to that or, or, or read it. I should. Um, Roxy is, is, is very good. And um, I did the, the audio version is a full cast, actually. But I did the bulk of the third person narration. Um, so that, that, was a, that was a good experience. I recommend checking that one out. Nice. Um, and is there any thing that you would still love to do in your career like I've I've noticed you've done some video game work you've done some anime work would you ever want to 
maybe take a character through an anime from beginning to end or is your heart a hundred percent in audiobooks I would love to add more commercial work on top of my audiobook narration. So the the ideal, and th this happens sometimes, but I would love for it to happen more, is to be recording an audiobook, to be in the studio all day, and knowing that you're also collecting residuals on a commercial that's running. That is awesome. I'd love for it to do that more often. That's good. That's like really, really smart. I love yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, My, unfortunately i'm not the only one with that idea <laughs> well you're also one of the people who has a golden voice lifetime achievement award so you've got that going for you you could always uh put that out there and be like listen i have a golden voice okay so yeah. you, want, you want my golden voice to absolutely be advertising your stuff and also you can listen to me on all of these fabulous audiobooks and understand why you need to hire me for this stuff on the side. Yeah, you should be my agent. Uh, I like the I, <laughs> I like what I'm doing <laughs> as a librarian, but thank you so much. That is a, a very nice compliment. All right, Michael Crouch, thank you so much for joining us on Turn the Page podcast. Uh, please consider coming back or if you're ever interested in doing a virtual event, um, we've done that with voice actors before. So putting that out there. Um, sure. And we are going to close this chapter of Turn the Page. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.